Welcome to Untying Knots, Minds and Souls Untethered with Perry Clark. This program looks at mental health from unique perspectives and shows you how to manage your life by finding the knots that help you and stay away from the ones that could be a disadvantage. Now, here is your host, Perry Clark. Hello all, welcome back to Untying Knots, Minds and Souls Untethered. This is Perry Clark with you, licensed marriage and family therapist, and I want to welcome you to our episode, our last episode of June, which is part of this that we've been doing for Pride Month, which has been had us off our normal cadence. So I want to start off with the classic that this is podcast is not a substitute for therapy. This is for entertainment and educational purposes, and I strongly recommend seeking out a therapist in your area to work on your unique issues. So today's guest, <laughs> kind of a little interesting story about how this came to be. So a couple of years ago, my partner gave me for Christmas, a book of poems. And it was a book called Original Kink. And I read through them and enjoyed them. And then the next year or so later, uh, my partner and I end up going on a vacation group trip with friends to the area of the country where the author of this book happened to live. And turns out he and I are both members of Onyx. Now, if you were listening to the last podcast with uh, Sean Maker, he mentioned uh, Onyx. And of course, I was being a little coy there about the fact that I knew about the organization because I'm also a member. And so this book was written by one of our members. And so while we were there, I had brought the book just on the off chance I might run into them to get, get them an autograph. And that turned out to have happened. And so when the podcast started, I definitely wanted to have this individual on here to talk about their experience as a poem, uh, poetry creator, because as I said with Sean, is that it's important for us to also spend time talking to people who create the materials we, um, we read and consume and are part of the world, because we also need to know about their mental health and the mental health that also went around the project. So today we're going to be um, we're talking with the author of Original Kink, Juby Aurelio Headley, who is a black queer poet, storyteller, and author of the poetry collection Original Kink by uh, Sibling Rival Press. Juby is the recipient of the 2021 Hostonic Book Award. I may have mispronounced that. Hostonic. House of Tonic. Okay, thank you. Uh, he's a 2018 PEN, that's P-E-N, American Emerging Voice Fellow, holds an MFA in creative writing from the University of Miami, and has received support for his work from Yado, Maleo, or Malay Arts, the Fine Works Art, Fine Arts Work Center, and the Palm Beach pa, 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 sorry, pa, the Palm Beach Poetry Festival, Lamba 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 Literary. I just seem to be tripping all over it today. And the Atlantic Center for the Arts. Juby and his poems have been featured in Literary Hub, The Rumpus, The Bellato uh, Poetry Journal, Nimrod, Southern Humanities Review, Washington Square Review, PBS News Hours, Brief but Spectacular, and elsewhere. Juby lives with his husband in South Florida uh, on Tisquate and Seminole lands, and his work explores themes of masculinity, vulnerability, rage, tenderness, and joy. Juby, welcome to Untying Knots. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for being here <laughs> and putting up for me, uh, being a bit of a fanboy, getting, getting your autograph. Uh, anytime. Um, uh, any poet who has a fan, more than one is quite a lucky poet. Yeah, hopefully we'll have some more after they hear about your work from here. So as I ask every guest on the show, how did you get here? How did I come to poetry? Uh, my story actually, in my opinion, or as I've shared it and compared it with other poets is a little different. I didn't write poetry when I was six and seven and eight, I don't think I liked poetry when I was six, seven or eight. And I didn't like it through high school. And it wasn't until college I came into contact with poetry 
that I really felt resonated with me. And I was lucky that through certain classes I took, uh, specifically in African-American studies, that I was introduced to black poets like Gwendolyn mm-hmm. Brooks and Sterling Brown and Haki Madhubuti and, and others. Uh, and I really enjoyed that poetry. But again, I didn't do much with poetry until my 40s. Mm-hmm. I, I have always wanted to be a writer, but I never thought that it was meant for me. Um, I was scared to, uh, to pursue it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I'm somebody who's done a lot of writing my professional life. In my professional life, I've worked with nonprofits in a consulting capacity for most of the past 10 years, especially. And I always wanted to do more. And we can get into my relationship with my father. And I bet you do with <laughs> lots of your guests as well as clients. But Suffice it to say, sometime about 10 years ago, between eight and 10 years ago, 2013, 2014, I think it was, I woke up one day. This is the only way I can describe it. And I knew I needed to write a book about my father. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you why that became a drive, but it felt as true to me as the sky is blue and the grass is green and I breathe air. Like it wasn't a desire. It was a mandate. That's how it mm-hmm. felt in my head. Mm-hmm. And I originally thought that I needed to write it in nonfiction. And like I said, I think of myself, I've, I've written a lot in the nonprofit context, but creative nonfiction is very different than writing a press release or a report or a case study mm-hmm. uh, or a fundraising letter, which are the kinds of things I've done in the past. And my nonfiction is not bad. Um, and I took classes and it was still not bad, but it wasn't sparking to mm-hmm. me. And mm-hmm. also I applied to some competitive programs to do workshops with people I would love to study with. And I wasn't really getting any traction there. You know, I got very kind rejections. Mm-hmm. And a, a poet I know said, you should just take a class in poetry. And I thought, why? And they said, just do it. They didn't give me any explanation. And I thought, odd, but okay, there's a, poetry class coming up and the poetry class was with a person named Jen Becker and it was called poetry boot camp. And it was offered by a local organization here in Florida called reading queer. And I took that two day boot camp as they called it and loved it in a way that I completely did not expect to. And the book went on the back shelf for a moment because I thought I need to do everything I can to learn more about poetry and how to write poetry. So I ran up my credit cards flying around the country and signing up for online versions of poetry classes. And poets, the few poets I knew, I would share what I wrote with them. And the very few first poetry I wrote, I am sure, was not good. And I am just blessed that the people that I shared it with didn't say, oh, please don't. They said, keep going. They didn't say it was amazing. Mm -hmm. They said, keep going. They encouraged me. And so for two or three years, three or four years, I just kept literally, if a poetry class came up, especially if it was a poet that I had read and thought wrote amazing poetry, I would sign up for that class. And I just got real excited by it. And 2017 was a transformational year for me because there's an organization called Vona that Mm -hmm. runs writing workshops for people of color. And it's a bit, or at least at the time, it was a bit of a sort of holy grail for a writer of color, or at least a specific Mm -hmm. kind of writer of color. And folks would feel if they got into Vona, like they had something, like Mm -hmm. they might go somewhere as a writer. And so it was a very exciting thing. Plus, you got to build community with other writers of color, which is not Mm -hmm. an easy thing to do Mm -hmm. in any circumstance. But when your writers are across the country, it's harder. And I submitted poetry and a poet, a poet I love named Willie Perdomo was the workshop leader. And he read my application and he said I was one of 10 people he was accepting to that workshop. And I met and I'm still friends with nine other brilliant, amazing poets who were there Mm -hmm. and me feeling like a fish out of water, like, oh my God, I was suffering from a great case of imposter syndrome. Like they're going to find out that I was a fluke and I have no talent. 
But luckily, again, they were very generous, and I learned so much. And Willie was such an amazing teacher um, and motivator. And I consider him a mentor. Not that we communicate regularly, but just somebody I look up to who sets a model of being a good and responsible and engaged literary citizen, as well as brilliant poet that I like to follow. So things just started happening at a much advanced speed after that. Shortly after that, one of the poets in that workshop told me about um, something called the PEN America Emerging Voices Fellowship. And that's run by an organization called PEN America. Their headquarters are in New York City. And their mission, quite literally, is around the world to advocate for freedom of speech and freedom of expression. So they do things like advocate for poets imprisoned in countries where freedom of expression, at least until recently, because we could talk about what's going on in Florida and Texas regarding silencing not only um, poets, but by virtue of um, the writings they are trying to ban, um, silencing students as well and teachers. But they told me about this fellowship and the idea of this fellowship was to professionalize emerging writers, not just poets, but writers broadly. And so they introduced you to other writers and they coach you on your writing and they coach you on reading your writing, um, engaging with audiences. So it's this whole sort of professionalization track that schools, MFA programs, Master of Fine Arts and Creative Writing programs don't typically give students. When you're in an MFA program, you learn about writing. Um, you learn about other poets writing. You don't necessarily learn how to get a book published. This fellowship did that. And I was just, I don't know, um, I guess I was, um, some combination of talent and luck got me to be out of a couple of hundred people who applied, one of five writers who was accepted. And that was just transformational. I got so much writing done there. I learned about the publication process um, and I, my com poetry community expanded so much. And after that, I actually applied to graduate school, got in there. And while I was in graduate school, worked uh, more and more on my writing and realized through year one of my two-year program that I had basically the bones of a manuscript. So in poetry, there are a few ways to get published. The most common way people get published is not like how fiction or nonfiction gets published. In fiction and nonfiction, you solicit an agent and the agent then puts you out there in the world and tries to get you a deal. In poetry, poetry doesn't generate income. So there are agents in a certain sense after you have become established to help you get opportunities. But most poets get published by submitting work directly to publishers, tiny publishers of poetry, or these various poetry contests that existed. So I picked about 20 over the course of six to eight months to submit my manuscript to. And one of them, Sibling Rivalry Press, said, we'd love to publish you. And they did. And everything since then has been kind of gravy. One of the things they don't tell you when you publish a collection of poems is that you will have as much fun talking to people about the work you know, um, people like the Perry Clarks of the world reaching out to you and going, hey, I'd like to talk to you about your poetry um, as you did writing it. And so I arrive at this place where I have this collection of poems in the world and the introvert in me now feels like I have a reason to be in the room. And mm. so people have a reason to talk to me and I get to talk about not only my poetry, but the work of other poets, poets who are long established, poets who are coming up that I know and love and just poetry in general and what poetry can do. That's kind of my story. So you covered a lot of ground there, my friend. You covered a lot yeah. of ground. And yeah. some definite pieces I want to go back and spotlight talk on it. But that's also one of those, again, what you've just said, like you said, the MFA program teaches about writing, not about how to get published. Exactly. And that's something that, yeah, fundamentally, a lot of us fail to get in our programs. I mean, even as a therapist, none of yeah. our, none of our schools taught us about how to do marketing, how to run a business, right. what to do with all, all of those things of what it means not to basically be in an agency. Right. So we have to go and get the supplemental education around that. Exactly. 
some of the things that you hit on so much about your experience was one, which I think for so many of us is the poetry we're exposed to in like high, middle school and high school is definitely not designed to connect with so many of us. If it's exactly. not feeling ancient, how many of us remember trying to write an iambic pentameter? Right, 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 right. <laughs> nope. Right. No, thank you. Right. I, so, you know, in high school, I was exposed to the old white men's school of poetry. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until college I found out there was more. So, yeah. Ex- exactly. So, even Langston Hughes and the aspect of where are we getting into writing that is also talking much more about our experiences which aren't always going to match with, say, Emily Dixon Dickinson's talking about depression. We're going right. to talk about depression so much differently than right. she is. And that aspect of how is that cutting us off from our ability to communicate? And I think that's one of the beauties that you, in your experience that you outlined, how you found a way to communicate some experiences that are just more, that touch much more about our experiences as men, men of color, men uh, of gender fluidity as well. Right, exactly. So let's go with that aspect of you said that there came a point where you knew you had to write something about your father, whether it was going to be nonfiction, fiction, or in this case, poetry. So how did that come about? I have probably had unresolved issues with my father for the greater part of my adult life. My father died when I was 18 in my first year of college, four weeks into my first year of college. He had colorectal cancer. And in all likelihood, it was discovered so late, there wasn't much they could do for him. My father was one of those sadly stereotypical older black men you will hear about who didn't go to the doctor. You had to be falling down to take yourself to the doctor. And I remember about eight months before he died, my father called me and he had been divorced from my mother for about five years by then. And, you know, the world is weird and the way families are constructed is weird. My father literally lived about five, six blocks from where we lived together in the house we lived in and mm-hmm. continue to after we were divorced. But I almost never saw him. Um, So when we saw each other, it was usually surprising, often friction laden, uh, partially because, you know, I was a young teenager who thought I knew a lot of shit, Uh, (laughs) whether or not I did. um, But also I was hiding a lot. So Mm -hmm. I had this father who was sort of your man's man, who was a ladies man, literally. Uh, my mother probably wouldn't appreciate me telling these stories, but there was always another woman in our house, not literally, Mm. but figuratively speaking. I grew up knowing the names of women and who it was presumed my father was stepping out with. Uh, So that's the kind of childhood I had. My father wasn't touchy feely. So it's not like we played catch or went on fishing trips. We didn't do that. My father's job was to be the provider. So if we had a roof over our house, heads and food to eat and clothes on our backs, that was what he was to do. There wasn't Mm -hmm. meaningful conversation or a lot of I love to use. My father told me he loved me twice that I can remember. Maybe I'm being unfair to him, but I can remember him saying the words, I love you. Junior, because that's what my family calls me, Junior. I'm actually named after him. But he told Mm -hmm. me I love you twice. And once was when the day he was leaving, packing after the divorce was final. And, or maybe during the separation. I don't remember. I was like 11 or 12. Uh, And the other day was about six months before he died, When, which is right after he told me he had cancer, which is how I realized he was dying. So I had this father that I hadn't had a good relationship with. I was going off to college. And in my head, I was going off to college to find the tools and the words to tell him and the courage, honestly, to tell him the things I thought I should tell him about who I was as a human in the world. I was not out to my family before my father died. Um, And I wonder what my process would have been like if my father was still alive, because it's not like he would have supported me based on everything I knew of him up to that point in my life. 
even now I can't fully believe that there's a universe where he would have been supportive, at least not initially. Mm -hmm. So what instead happened was I went to college to gain this strength and these tools and these words. And four weeks into my first semester, my father dies. And I had so much I had never said. And so let me transition to a part of the story where I tell you something that's probably mythical or at least hard to believe. Um, I had a dream about my father, maybe about six months after he died. And in the dream, have you ever seen um, this painting? It's called The Scream mm -hmm. by Edvard Munch. Mm -hmm. um, so, so for folks who are listening, if you haven't seen it, it's basically like sort of a back background. And there's like this face that looks ghostly uh, with his mouth wide open coming up out of an abyss. Um, just looking like it's screaming. And literally in the dream, that is how I experienced my father. Like he was trying, except that he was reaching for me. And he, his eyes looked hollow and terrified and his mouth was open and he was trying to talk to me. And I was so scared that I woke myself up mm -hmm. and immediately regretted it because I didn't know what my father had to say to me. And so I, in my mind at least, set an intention that I, he should come back to me in a dream and he never did. And when I say never, what I mean is for the next 30 years, I, well, for the next 20 years, I don't remember a dream where he came back. And so when I woke up with this intention, I assumed it was, okay, you're in your forties now, Jude. You're ready to have the conversation. You can't have it with him, but you still don't have closure. You're ready to have all the conversations about who you are in the world that you never got to have with him. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's where the book came from. Um, my need to work out some issues, some things, or at least put them on paper, where I wanted to say some things about my relationship with him, um, not necessarily to anybody, because if you ask a lot of poets, we don't write with a specific audience in mind always. We might write a poem with an idea of we're talking to someone, but we're not reaching out to specific types of readers. So I'm most of the time, I feel like I'm writing to my younger self. And that's kind of the take I have when I approach writing a poem. Um, not always, but very, very often. Sometimes because I feel maybe based on my history, maybe based on how I viewed my relationship between my father and my mother, I sometimes feel like I'm writing to a certain group of Black women. But all of that said, I think that's where the book came from. I felt a real need to work through some issues and put them on paper. And I had gained this tool of poetry, which let me write these things in a certain way that felt very accessible to me. So it was kind of my own work. I don't really think of it as doing therapy. I think of it as creative writing, but I will admit that it had some absolute emotional benefit for me to do the work of putting some of my emotions and feelings and stories into this collection. Beautifully put, which in many ways is why we as therapists will use creative writing as a method for helping with processing of experiences. Mm. And it's most especially poetry. And I want to give out a shout out to who my teacher who can sort of converted my sense as well around enjoying poetry to John Fox of uh, the Poetic Medicine organization uh about how we find that way to process the information that and be able to have those experiences as you said this work of art is a way of you processing your conversations with your dad and ultimately also towards the women too in your life yeah there are many ways that that is probably more therapeutic and probably knock some time off of not having to sit on one of our couches um for, for you to get through that. And it's something that everyone is capable of doing. Doesn't necessarily mean it ends up in a anthology form, but even if it's just written for oneself, that is mm -hmm. something that's there. Mm. Um, that seems right. Yeah. And I think that's also one of the critical things too, about going back to what I was saying about this creators and how the mental health standpoint, your creation of this was a way of working around for your mental health as well. Mm. And that's something I think that, so. yeah, and that's something that doesn't always get acknowledged and appreciated, let alone normalized in our culture that what we're creating is also a way of helping our mental health. Mm, right. right. So if you don't mind, I 
would like to read a, one of the sections out. It's a short one. That's all right. Okay. All right. And so funny, the one that I picked was confessional. <laughs> okay. And it goes, only thing I've ever longed to be ain't rich or famous or thin or even white, but naked. I like that one. <laughs> I think it's a very important one because it's, again, what we just want to be ourselves. I think right. That's one, at least one of the takeaways. I know there's some other levels in there, uh, which we don't have time to get into, but it's <laughs> one of the most, uh, one of those that's most profound of, of us just wanting to be. And yeah. I mean, we've seen, but go ahead. It is, it, and you're right, there are other levels. Uh, it can be taken literally, but that's the fun of writing poetry, hmm. or at least part of the fun of writing poetry. You can, if you frame your poem well, you can say a thing that might mean seven things and let the reader take whichever one or two or three, or if they can access all of them, wonderful, but they get to take away what they want. If you take away from that poem, I'm a nudist, I'm okay with that. If you take away the that other level where I'm saying, can you see me? Can I be my authentic, unconcerned, mm -hmm. unadorned, um, unpretentious self to you? Then that's even better for me. And Louis, mm -hmm. that's kind of where that came from. And that's why I named it confessional. Um, and you know, I love what I, Richard, you know, things people aim to be. Um, I, I've been writing more poetry about how, as I get older, my ambitions are getting more specific and also less grandiose. Hmm. Um, maybe when I was in my early 20s, I wanted to be something called successful. But A, what I called successful isn't now what I care about in terms of success. Whether or not mm -hmm. I own a house, I do own a house and I'm mm -hmm. happy I own a house. But if I didn't own a house, I could still be a happy human today. Mm -hmm. Once upon a time, no. Once upon a time, I cared about a car, could care less now. What I want mm -hmm. now is to feel good in my own skin. I want to have good friends. I want people to respect me as a decent human being. I want people to go, hey, do you know Juby? Oh yeah, he's a great guy. I want to see the world and experience new things. So that's kind of where that poem was born. Just sort of rethinking how as you get older, um, you can change and adapt and evolve into spaces where your ambitions are just so much less material than they used to be. That's kind of where that comes from. Yeah, and I think that is something that is a lesson we get, often get forgotten mm -hmm. as we grow up and go on into this world and confront so many different things. It's holding very much that very juvenile uh, way of being and pushed in so many ways. And believe me, I hear it from clients who are, dealing with what we call the quarter life crisis as they realize right. the world isn't as they've done all the things that they were told to do. And it's not happening right. equally as someone else said, the 50 year old crisis where not just the, you know, run off and find the young beauties, but that standpoint is like, Oh, you were supposed to be already been the director of the company or exactly. already this massive published person. And yet no, you're still middle management. Yeah. Or yeah. you're still trying to find that, literary agent or that piece of artwork there yeah. but you find beauty and you find connection and success in so many other places and that's something that through your work there through what we do in counseling is help people find that mm. that's brilliant that absolutely is is it i um you know 50 for me uh, has been liberating the I'm not gonna to pretend to be perfect and, and fully evolved and, and saved. Mm -hmm. I still have my moments of jealousy. I still have my moments of regret. What if I had started this 25 years ago? Who could mm -hmm. I be now in mm -hmm. poetry or in my life? But mostly I have gotten to a place where I accept who I am and there's some things about me that I don't really wanna change whether or not you think they're good. And so I am learning to care less about the externalities, about what people think about me and just trying to be happy mm -hmm. and rested, rested. Uh, oh. If there's one thing I learned from the pandemic, it's more about rest. 
I am not going to let you press me into too much stress anymore. Mm-hmm. I, I can't control it always because, you know, we live in the world we do. I got to I got to work. But I rest so much more now. I love an afternoon nap. And I'm lucky <laughs> that I work from home um, because I'll say, oh, I'm just so sorry. I already booked an appointment at, at three and from three to four, maybe four thirty because I can take a 90 minute nap. I will be out and I mm-hmm. will wake up just happy with myself like, ah, that mm-hmm. feels good. Mm-hmm. So I'm a little different now than I was 10 or 20 years ago, shall we say. Well, I think that's a perfect place for us to take a break so that <laughs> if, it, if everyone wants to pause the recording and take a nap, please do so. <laughs> yes, we're going to take naps. <laughs> get that rest in. Get that rest in. So, and then come back and continue to hear our second half. I'm Perry Clark. I'm here with Juby Arello Headley on Untying Knots. We'll be back with you shortly, folks. Our lives and the world around us can get messy and frustrating. Untangle and Grow Counseling's focus is to untangle that mess and make sense of it so you have a good foundation to build and grow from. Visit us on the web at untangleandgrowcounseling.com. Perry Clark offers individual psychotherapy, couples and family therapy, and adolescence therapy from a variety of coping materials and resources. Visit untangleandgrowcounseling.com for more information. When it comes to business, you'll find the experts here. Voice America Business Network. You are listening to Untying Knots, Minds and Souls Untethered. If you have a question or comment about our podcast, send an email to pclark at untyingknotspodcast.com. That's pclark at untyingknotspodcast.com. And now, back to the program. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I hope you had a good nap. So we're here with Mm -hmm. our second half uh, with uh, Juby Aurelio Headley the author of Original Kink. I'm Perry Clark, licensed marriage and family therapist, and this is Untying Knots. So what was the hardest part of writing Original Kink for you? My family. Hmm. The hardest part of writing sometimes is caring about audience. And I managed to get through the process of writing without caring, but Mm -hmm. there was, and if you become a writer in this sense, you will find out there's a lag time between when you write a book and when that book gets accepted by a publisher. And then when it gets published, there was a year between when I signed a contract to publish this book and when it got published. And that year was harder than the writing of the poetry. I am lucky that I had a, folks, teachers and colleagues and fellow poets and fellow students that encourage me to write from a difficult place, that encourage me mm-hmm. to dig deep. The difficult part was realizing that my family could read this poetry because mm-hmm. I put some very personal things in here. And when you write poetry, you're not always writing from a place of absolute fact or absolute history. Uh, I was just reading an article by another poet, Andrea Cohen, where they said in the article, uh, poetry is a combination of memory and imagination. So my father is neither as wonderful wherever he appears there as such, or as terrible wherever he appears there as such. In my poetry, he wasn't that person exactly in real life because you use image and metaphor and imagination to make it a more interesting poem to read. Because after all, I'm still creating a piece of art I want you to have a reaction to. Um, And maybe my father said something much less inflammatory than what I said he said, but in my mind, I judged that that thing needed to be amped up. That all said, there's enough of me and my memories and my history in there that certain things by my family can be recognized. And I found myself in this place where I thought, I've never asked for permission. And there's a another long-standing sort of 
idea in especially creative nonfiction, but poetry as well, that you don't ask for permission. It's your story too. And I believe that to a degree, but I don't want to make my family uncomfortable. I don't want to hurt them. And in fact, I realized I also don't want to have discussions with my family about specific instances I write about Mm -hmm. in my life. Um, I wrote about a, there's a poem in the book called Interior Pilgrim Theater. And it's basically about my experience when I was in high school, because when I was in high school, um, it was 1986. And we didn't have gay straight alliances in high schools. We didn't have gender neutral restrooms. We didn't have the internet. We didn't Mm -hmm. have will and grace. We didn't have so much that we have now. So in 1986, most of my experiences meeting other gay men were to be perfectly transparent, either uh, through pretending I was older than I was and sneaking into the bars I could find or cruising. Um, And so the Pilgrim Theater was a place that showed a certain type of movie that attracted a certain type of person during the middle of the day, which was the only time they probably had to get away from the life their families and friends thought they were living to interact with other men. He said euphemistically. Um, Mm -hmm. And my mother said, I was so crushed to realize that was your experience. And I had this visceral reaction to her saying that, making me think that's a poem. It's a part of my history, but I don't really want to go into it with you about what I was doing when I was skipping school, junior year in high school at this level. Um, And so that was really, I don't know how to say that was the hardest part, realizing that I was implicating myself in very specific ways to people who love me and were going to feel a way about it. But also that I was telling stories that implicated them that I would not only didn't ask for permission to write, am not going to ask for permission to write. Mm -hmm. So somebody who knows that my sister is my sister might read a story about my father and say, I didn't know your father was that terrible. Um, Or I didn't know your father was that kind of person. And now my sister has to deal with the implications of my having written that poem and put it out into the world. And I haven't reconciled that. I can only say that even though that is a struggle, I'm still doing it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And I say also that it's probably a blessing that how I choose to do it as a writer is in the form of poetry because (laughs) poetry does not have the hugest audience. So Mm -hmm. the number of people I have to worry will run across my sister and read my poetry is vanishingly small. If Mm -hmm. I was writing a creative nonfiction book and trying to get it published out there like memoirs do, that's Mm -hmm. a lot more exposure. But Mm -hmm. that's the challenge. Trying not to feel too much guilt or because, you know, the mind spins or how dare you not feel too much guilt? Maybe you should feel absolutely guilty and stop writing about them and anything that implicates them entirely. So depending on the day, I'm either in the strident, I'm going to do this mode or, oh my God, I'm a terrible son mm-hmm. mode. That's the hard part. And I'm sure other poets might talk about the actual process of writing. I had an experience where I had people encouraged me to keep going harder and deeper. So I felt very free during the writing process. I feel very free during the writing process. And, you know, I think maybe my background, my my affinity for certain kinks means I'm already willing to explore beyond what conventional, shall we say, I don't like the word normal so much, but conventional Mm -hmm. boundaries Mm -hmm. for sexuality might be. So I, I write a lot of things that I feel like I get out there more than a lot of other people. And I love them. Mm -hmm. But then the publication time comes and I I think, oh, yeah, I forgot. My mother's going to read about the time I had ecstasy in college and had that experience. What would she think? Mm -hmm. Or that's kind of (laughs) it. Or like the events in Godzilla's Lament. Mm, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Godzilla's Lament is, is largely about you know, sort of, and I wish this was not true for me. I want to be a better bear and you can decide whether or not we should explain to your audience what a bear is, but I, I have body (laughs) issues. I want to pretend I don't, but I constantly do. I Mm -hmm. feel fat lots of days and some days I'm brilliant on that. 
Mm-hmm. And other days I'm like, you loaf. It, your center of gravity is somewhere around the Earth's core. You can't stand up. Look at you in that mirror. Or you've outgrown yet another pair of pants. Or this used to fit you. Or I'm trying to buy new clothes. Oh, wow. Look how many sizes bigger. It's real. Um, it's a struggle. I, I want to not have that struggle, but I do. And especially when we're trying to buy leather. Oh, oh, oh Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, yes. Yeah. Chaps around my thighs. It takes a very specific measurement. So custom leather is sometimes necessary. And extremely expensive. And for the, just for those yeah. that are not familiar with what bears are, it is used basically a sort of labeling that we use in the LGBT community for those of us that are larger framed, usually hairy, but usually it is the larger framed. Now, yeah. for those of us uh, of the uh, BIPOC community, we are also embracing the word thick as a way of right. describing who we are, as opposed to being bears. So there is that standpoint too. And I think that also very much speaks into, which I guess got to also say, whoever your cover model was for Original Kink is just also a treat in that standpoint of, yeah. Someone call him a muscle bear. Someone call him muscle. Either way, he's yeah. thick and yeah. love the the locks he's got. Yeah, yeah. I um I called my book original kink because as you read the poems, I play on the sense of kink in multiple ways. Because like all poets, I am pretty sure this is universally true of anyone who calls them a poet. We love levels. So mm-hmm. I want you to read the word naked and think about it on five levels. Kink as sexual exploration and play, but also kink as in black hair, kink Mm -hmm. as in rope in certain places, kink Mm -hmm. literally as in challenges in the universe. So I found that model on Instagram. Um, I was going through Instagram because a few other poets told me the way I Mm -hmm. found cover art was I looked on Instagram for artists and came across somebody I love. So I didn't know what I was going to do. I was just waiting for something to hit me. I just was trying to find all the black artists. Mm -hmm. Um, And and I should point out, um, the person who took this photo, Andrew Marshall, is a white gay man, but the model considers himself that man's collaborator. Um, Mm -hmm. Because I did reach out to the model to make sure he was okay with his image being used this way, and he loves it. And all he asked of me was I send him many copies of the book, which I have done. Um, But I, I scrolled and I scrolled and I found another piece of art that was a literal artwork more than as in it was a painting and I loved it. And so I was going to send that to my publisher and then I kept scrolling and I saw this and I said, Oh my God, this is a black man who is thick, like you say, and just buff and sexy in the most suggestive pose possible. And he's got locks and there's gray in the locks. Cause I was about to also have, bring that too. Know, I might have body issues, but I am so secure in my age. I feel like I just keep getting better. In Mm -hmm. that sense. So I was like, I get to bring up an older, sexy black man and Mm -hmm. put him on the cover of my book. And and the other thing that happened was I remembered Essex Hemphill's book, Ceremonies. And that was a book of poetry that came out in the 90s. Um, I don't remember exactly what year, but before he died in 1994 of of AIDS. Um, And he was a brilliant poet and activist from back in the day when you and I probably were in our late teens, early 20s. and he is in Tongues Untied. As a matter of fact, he's seminal to Tongues Untied. He was a collaborator of Marlon Briggs, who is the director and producer. Um, so he is like for us, us being black gay men, he's sort of an icon. And I thought, oh my God, if I do this kind of cover, because on his cover, he has a man sort of not a, who is also naked, also defined, also has locks, sort of with arms up raised in a gesture of like celebration or offering. And I thought this cover can sort of be an homage to Mm -hmm. that cover. Look how many things I can do if I get this artist to agree to let me be, let him use this image on my cover. So I was just like, literally, I showed my husband both Mm -hmm. pieces of art, the the painting and this, and he was like, I don't even understand how this is a contest. And I sent it to my publisher, who is another gay man, and he, I sent him both and said, and he said, absolutely, absolutely the first one. And the first one being what ended up on there. Mm-hmm. I, 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 there wasn't anybody in the universe who didn't say, oh, my God, that is absolutely the right cover for your Juby's poetry. Mm-hmm. So it, it was like just I, I feel blessed. I don't know if the universe sent it to me or what, but 
Well, I was and, just happy about it. Well, and, and if I was to take it a different standpoint, there is a classic work of artwork called the um, Nine Ages of Woman. Mm-hmm. Or nine faces of woman, something like that, which shows women and women in various stages of life development and um, sensuality and so forth. And I see mm-hmm. that also in this piece here. You, he is like you said, point out the multiple different ways that are being represented here in sexuality, exactly. sin, uh, uh, identity, as well as essentially our blackness. Right. I I, I like revel in the blackness of that particular photo it just it felt so um celebratory it felt so uplifting it was just and it felt so unapologetic and unashamed all the Mm -hmm. things i aspire to be in the world i was like our capsule in this photo sexy um older unapologetic unashamed proud prideful blackity black Mm -hmm. i was just you know so Mm -hmm. yeah I'm almost as proud of that photo as I am of my poetry, believe it or not. Well, they go well together. So what else are you focusing on now as you move onward from this work and the next pieces or next work that's coming out there? Yeah. Um, We talked about rest before the break. Mm -hmm. I, I had what I can only term and I have not, I have done some reading on it. I had a panic attack about two weeks after George Floyd. Um, I was one day I read something else about what was happening and I started hyperventilating. I could not catch my breath. I could not breathe. And the irony or the symbolism of that was not lost on me in the moment, but literally I was terrified. I didn't know what's happening. I was like, why is this happening to me? And I know intellectually in retrospect that I should have been able to identify as a panic attack because I've heard about it. But in the moment, I just thought I was, I was losing my mind. I took like Mm -hmm. an hour walk, just trying to breathe. It didn't work. I um, laid down and that didn't work. I took another walk. And then finally I came back and said, okay, just take deep breaths and try to breathe. And I did that for like a half hour. And somehow that led to sleep, Mm -hmm. which I did as people around me, because I wasn't in the house alone, told me later, I did for like four hours in the middle of the afternoon. I like went to sleep finally around five and I woke up like at 9, 30, 10. Um, and that left me in a place where I felt like rest became this very profound thing. Um, but it's not defined only in terms of sleep. It's defined as in, you've got to not let the world burden you in certain ways anymore. Um, Hmm. you've got to be free of certain shackles for lack of a better word. And as I started to free myself of the concerns and started to say, I can't let y'all have, but so much of me, um, I started to think about going beyond just rest and thinking, okay, how do I gain joy and pleasure in the world? And specifically pleasure. Um, Some people think it seems to me of pleasure is in a negative sense as less meaningful than joy. And I don't know that that is true. I have started to think of pleasure as something that we should all seek out because the experience of pleasure whether or not it lasts forever, the Mm -hmm. memory of it is something as well as the experience of it that uplifts us and is a, is a good in and of itself to seek out. So I've started writing a lot of poems about pleasure, um, which has me writing a lot more about sex, but also has me writing a lot more about food and, and and other types of things that bring me joy. One of the things I'm really excited about, I don't, I do this at certain points in original kink, but I'm exploring it a lot more. I'm starting to write a lot more humor into my poetry. Um, I love a good joke. Um, And sometimes I just let the joke stand as the poem and you end on a laugh. But other times I, I, you know, I, I follow some of the great um, jokesters of the world and that joke has some weight to it. You know, if I could be Richard Pryor, I would be, Um, but I'm me. So I write poetries, but I'll tell a joke and that poem will end dark. Like, Mm -hmm. Oh, you didn't know it was going to turn that way. Did you? Mm-hmm. But that's a, not only a wonderful device for poetry, it's a wonderful new mode of expression for me. So rest, humor, pleasure. Maybe that's what I'm more seeking out um, in my next collection of poems, which I, I, I will not tell you the name yet because I'm not mm-hmm. settled on it, but I just got the contract for my second collection of poems today. 
about two hours ago. Excellent. Um, so I, it's not signed yet. I have to go through it and see if it's good. But right. somebody wants to publish it. So yay me. Right. Well, I hopefully by the time this airs, you have signed that. And maybe we'll have an update on what that title will be. But either way, you know, I'm going to be buying it. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, two times. Yeah. So I'm going to blend this, my typical question about the myths and realities around mental health with actually something else I've recently asked a few other of our who've been on the podcast, which also relates to the sense of our creativity. And this also blends into also us both being members of Onyx, which is a leather group for men of color that also involves kink as well. What do you think it is about our culture that makes it so hard to in- see this as part of it? Whether it is the kink, whether it is our interest in poetry even to the sexual and so forth i think i track everything back to two things in the world i track all of the things that are challenges and that i consider evil in the world to two things and sometimes it's capitalism and sometimes it's the middle passage Mm -hmm. um in this case maybe both but i i will say this i really think that because of the legacies of how black folks particularly in this country have had to live so many of us grew up with the notion that we can't be anything other than the model of whatever is established as appropriate and propriety in the world. Um, So that if there's any deviation from that, we risk fracturing this very fragile sort of understanding. And it comes a lot from, I think, this internalization of the experiences we had We may not even know what I think, but we act like we deserve them. So, you know, we're talking about kink, but also for some people, I know for me at times, what would you question why you got stopped by the police? What could I have done differently? It's almost like women and sexual assault. You know, there's a there's this propensity to say, well, what were you wearing? What could you have done differently? Like it's the woman's responsibility to not be assaulted as opposed to the man's responsibility to not assault or the other person's responsibility. Mm -hmm. I think we end up in this situation where we have this notion of we have to carry ourselves in such a very specific way through the world. Anything that deviates from that, anything that deviates from that is a problem. But also sort of going back to what we're just talking about, there is this demonization of pleasure as something temporary and fleeting. And that's probably partially, maybe mostly biblical. If we are doing something called pleasure, which kink, at least in one way, can be defined as a a seeking of pleasure, a pushing yourself beyond boundaries, um, that is that's indulgent, people think that's so selfish, that's internally focused, as opposed to thinking about something other than yourself, the kinds of things that we end up exploring in the kink world are things that people just can't get comfortable with, I think a lot because they don't want to put that kind of focus on themselves and really think about what am I really trying to seek out in the world? What are the boundaries I'm willing to accept? What do I want to push beyond? Um, And leather is entirely in some ways and kink. They are about those things. There are worlds we haven't explored that might be exciting to us. And what happens if we explore them? Do we gain new insights? Do we become more enlightened people? Do we get a moment of pleasure? Um, Is that allowable? Am I allowed to say I like to get spanked, but also to spank? Um, Is any of that something that I could say that, you know, just out in the world that half the world would be like, ew, Mm -hmm. but have they explored it? So like I said, I think, I don't even know if I made sense, but I think a lot of it, is really that sense we've got to carry ourselves in a certain way, especially as Black folks, because we can't deviate from a path that keeps us safe and keeps us above reproach because the world stays in the criminalization mode when it relates to us. And so we can't afford Mm -hmm. to invite that in. Mm -hmm. And not that we have to get too deep into it. As I'm writing and recording this, about mid mid April, and at this point, the world has been dealing with a lot of everything that happened with 
the Oscars and the slap. I was waiting for you to say the slap. <laughs> the slap, yes. yeah. And how much that fits into uh, so many of the responses, because they're, again, not going to get involved in any of the talk around that, yeah. but how much that influences this sense of view and not exactly. whether it's just our interest in kink, leather, and BDSM, but even to the aspect of creating poetry, loving science fiction, loving fantasy, right. being right. a geek about these mm -hmm. things. And in many ways, mental health wise, to have these things is to be healthy. Yes. Doesn't mean you're getting right. all of them, but as long as you've got parts of it that make you happy, you right. are living. I and agree. there are those who prefer the idea that we always have to be in suffering. Right, right, right. We've got to break out of that. And that's part of rest. There is this wonderful person, um, I, they're probably on everywhere, Twitter, all the social media, but I follow them on Instagram. Um, it's called the Nat Ministry. And it's a mm -hmm. woman who lives in Atlanta who's got a master's in divinity. And she talks about rest as liberation. And I think that is what, or a way to frame what you're talking about. Um, we've got to allow ourselves to deserve the things that should be inherent rights. We've got to reframe how we think about these things. We our old pleasure. We are old rest. Mm -hmm. let, and this is where capitalism comes in. I am not going to let a production oriented mentality keep me grinding to the mm -hmm. point where I'm exhausted and stressed. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to be healthy to the extent I can be the ways I know how. And one of those is I've got to be mentally just chill. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like being mentally chill. It's easier I've been the anxious guy. I know how to do that very well. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be. So I'm working against that constantly. And rest is part of that. Seeking pleasure is part of that. Um, you know, I, I think it's funny you mentioned the slap. I Part of what bothered me is there were so many different reactions to that. We're not, you said it. We're not going to get into them. And very few of the reactions were, how does that make Jada feel? Mm -hmm. um, but also, here's another one. Will Smith is a person who has spent his entire career cultivating the Black, white American. Mm -hmm. Maybe you, you reject that, but what I really mean by it is he has tried to be the most popular person in the room as much as he can. He wants, he wants to be universal. That's his goal. That mm -hmm. is not the artist's goal almost ever. We're trying to be us. But he has tried to be literally universal. Like, I want everybody to like me. He has spent millions of dollars cultivating an image. Think about what kind of psychic break it took for him to get to the moment where, in arguably the biggest moment of his life, he walked up to a stage and slapped another Black man. Mm -hmm. He's literally the, the person I would think of if you said, who has the most carefully cultivated image? And he had a complete break. Something that everybody who probably knows him thinks is entirely out of character. And he did in front of a billion people. Mm -hmm. So he needs you or a you. He's got to do some serious work because mm -hmm. he's broken a little bit. He's broken a little bit. That's how that's kind of how I see that. Well, I, and I also think about what happened with Michael P. Jordan when he was playing Killmonger in Black Panther. Right. And the aspect of, as he said afterward, he had to do therapy to break out of the method character that he was in mm. one question we may want to wonder is was there a moment where will was still in king richard that's fascinating and i had not at all thought of it but i hear you i hear you i hear you was that king richard still playing him in him mm. in that moment mm. which is also the dangers that someone called acting equally there is one other element that in and i also noticed in this is the uh, speaking about chris rock is Everyone seems to have forgotten about he's also dyslexic, uh, not dyslexic, he's also autistic. I don't think I knew that. It's one of the things that has come out in the last few years about the fact that he is autistic. He's on the spectrum. He has been masking his autism for a, quite a while. Wow. Wow. Okay, you're dropping some knowledge here. I which, did not know that. Which he, like the uh, uh, other comedian, Hannah Gatsby, uh, and mm -hmm. I really respect, suggest watching her Nanette um, special on um, Netflix means that social cues are going to be handled differently. And if right. people were laughing at the joke in its rehearsal and its crafting stage, that 
cueing that this might not be a good place to have that joke wasn't going to show up, not to mention the trauma Chris is also going through from getting right. Right. So we have two black men who have been hurt. Right. So there's so much there to be working on. And how are we normalizing the idea of them getting help? Thank you. Versus both. Yeah, Mm. they both need it. (laughs) Jada needs it. All of them need it versus the vilification. Right. Amen. Absolutely. That's the thing. Yes, you said it. So with that being said, I know we segued on so much in that. (laughs) Where can folks find you if they want to learn more and get in line to get your new book? Um, The easiest way to find me uh, is on my website. It is justjuby.com. J-U-S-T. Mm. J-U-B as in boy, I, dot mm-hmm. com. Um, because I have been, as part of my rest regime, diminishing or, or reducing my presence on social media. So I can't guarantee I'll respond quick. But you can send me messages through my website and I get them in my email and I respond to that much quicker. Or right. you can just look for my books there. So, okay. And I think recently, probably by the time this has, had aired, you were also teaching some classes. Do you think you'll be doing yeah. some more classes in the future? I hope so. It was a really um, wonderful experience. Um, I was lucky, maybe. I had very generous students. I really enjoyed it. So I'm hoping to end up in conversations to teach a couple more classes, um, one at a time, probably, but in the fall mm-hmm. and spring of next year. Yes, absolutely. So in a way, you got to return the favor of uh, that you had had earlier on by continuing to teach. That is a beautiful way to look at that. Thank you for that. Yes, yes. So symmetry in it all. Right. So if you don't mind, I'm going to leave, wrap us up by reading Godzilla's Lament as oh, we go okay. forward. After, or would you have a different one that you'd suggest? No, no, no. Uh, uh, go with that. That is wonderful. So we're going to go and close with that. And this is uh, I've, this is Perry Clark, licensed marriage and family therapist here on Untying Knots. And believe me, there's also metaphor and levels with Untying Knots and so many things. Here with Jub- mm. Juby Aurelio Headley, uh, author of Original Kink, and this is Godzilla's Lament. What would it feel like if I loved this body? Really loved it. Like these fat folds were swaddling? Like I had ballerina's feet without the gnarl? Like I'd earned the right to take this much space? Like I was a beacon, a craze, and a flock a flocked, flocked, that float to me, flies to honey, maggots to rotten flesh, like I wasn't worried about death, wasn't prey, wasn't an aftermath, like I was a monster. Juby, thank you for being here. Thank you for writing these pieces and letting me read that. Thank you so much for reading it and for inviting me and for seeing me. Undoubtedly. So... Tune in next time, folks, and I hope you've had a good Pride Month. Be well. Thank you for tuning in for Untying Knots, Minds and Souls Untethered. Be sure to join your host, Perry Clark, for another episode on the podcast coming soon on the Voice America Empowerment Channel.